Hi guys, welcome. My name is David Jaffe, and I'm here with Bernie from Zero DTE. And this has actually been a conversation that we've been planning on having for a really long time. As some of you, 2022, I was dealing with an illness, and Ernie was one of the one of the few people who would constantly like reach out to me and try to help me. He really helped me get better. Like as far as when I was having breathing issues, I was elevating my my sleeping position and things like that. And finally, I've made enough progress, and we decided to hop on this call. We hope that you guys find this extremely valuable. And uh, yeah. Ernie, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I'm really happy that I had a positive impact. I didn't know that I was so impactful. You had sent me a, an email thanking me and everything, but I just thought I was just doing what I would normally do and just someone is in need and try to do whatever I can to help them out. Sometimes I feel like I'm overreaching my bounds. No, you definitely wouldn't. And I definitely I think that maybe some people who have good intentions, they also feel that they might be intruding. but the reality is that if everyone feels that way, then nobody comes to provide assistance and to provide help. And I can say with absolute certainty that you are one of the few people who consistently reached out to me and provided valuable advice and really showed that you truly cared. And remember that even though we're going to be speaking a lot about ways to build your wealth and to be and to make extra money, your health is probably one of it's probably the most important aspect of your life. And uh, if you're op if you're operating at optimal efficiency, then you're going to be able to make better decisions and make more money as well. Maybe we can start with that as a topic because I have this kind of dichotomy. I feel like I'm in pretty good shape, but I've got this really this jelly belly, or it's not jelly; it's hard, but it, it's big. And I and it's because I probably eat too much. But on the other hand, I walk every day. I do ten thousand steps a day. My heart rate's low. My blood pressure is low. No no cholesterol. So by all the numbers, I'm in pretty good shape, but uh, I just eat too much, I think. And so now I've started a program of intermittent fasting, which I've done before. And quite frankly, I was actually in much better shape a few years ago. I was doing Bikram yoga. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, the hot yoga. It lasts 90 minutes. You get into a room that's about 110 degrees and 40% humidity. And it was really great. And I lost a lot of weight. It was fantastic. And you just feel like you're balanced. Everything about it is fantastic. And then the studio closed. And so I couldn't go anymore. And I searched out other studios, never found one that I really liked. That's part of when you're doing something, it's hard. It's one thing to get into the habit of doing something. And then it's a, it's another to stick with it because you get used to the way things work. And then when they change, you can get off of that habit. And uh, even though you know that you shouldn't, you try to get back onto it, but you never find that click again. And so now I'm left on my own. But fortunately, I walk every day. I, I do a five mile trail walk every day with my wife and my dogs uh, every night. And so that has at least helped me maintain. My thoughts on if you have a little bit of belly fat or something of that nature, it would be similar to what you said about like walking, getting sun. For some reason, getting exposing your body to a lot of sun and that vitamin D synthesization, it's almost like we're not necessarily plants and we don't have chlorophyll, but exposing your body to sun will increase your vitamin D3 levels, which is a strong hormone. Additionally, as you mentioned, like intermittent fasting is really important. When you mentioned that, my first thought was you can actually eat as much food as you want, as long as you're eating it in a relatively compressed eating window. So yeah. simply by skipping breakfast and not eating three hours prior to you going to sleep, not only does that improve your sleep, because while you're sleeping, instead of your body spending time digesting, you'll actually be introducing some forms of autophagy, which means like self eating. So your body's going to be eating some of this, some of the damaged proteins and things like that. But really, I think the most important thing would be a compressed eating window. And probably similar to what you were saying about the Bikram yoga, you can do like an infrared sauna, which I have a video on my channel where you can build like a really cheap sauna and put it in your garage or your bathroom for $300. You don't have to spend like the four or $5,000 on one, one of those, like the infra, like the other saunas from like sauna space, etc. You can literally make one for $300. And I think probably, I know it's pretty common for people to say, oh, it's like your sugar consumption, and high fructose corn syrup. But I actually think that one of the bigger things that you could do is reduce your intake of vegetable oils. Because what happens is your omega-6, if you eat a lot of vegetable oils, then that increases your omega-6 intake. And it's really hard 
to get rid of that stuff because it actually makes up your cell membranes and it'll take your body like anywhere from three to five to seven years. I've heard like different varying amounts of how long it takes your body to recycle and to get rid of that, those omega sixes. I think that probably if I had to rank them, it would be like compressed eating window, probably the most important. Reduce your vegetable oils would be second. The infrared sauna would be third. Because the infrared, your body will actually like increase your production of vitamin D3 and melatonin because the infrared is similar light spectrum to what you're going to get is from the sun. And then like sun and walking would will also help. Yeah, I'd add to that sleeping. Yeah, I would say that sleeping is probably the most important thing. In fact, I just got this thing here, the, the Aura Ring. And that's supposed to be able to monitor. I've only been wearing it now for two days. So I've just started the program. And I've also started the intermittent fasting. I'm also doing one day a week where I do a full fast for, for 36 hours. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So all of that, I used to do that all the time and I was able to stay fit, but I think I have just one of those bodies that if you just, it's easy for me to start gaining the weight. And I don't know why, because I'm putting, doing plenty of exercise. But anyways, the sleeping, I think, is a big thing. And more importantly, the thing about this is that it allows you to monitor what you're doing. And I think that's the most important part, whether it's your health or your business or your trading, being able to get a level set where you are and then build from there and then be able to look back and see where you are and what you have to do in order to maintain the progression that you hope to be on, I think is probably one of the most important things because it's so easy to just get off track without ever noticing. You just, you get diverted with life and you start going down a path and developing bad habits without even knowing it. And then you don't even know it until it's too late. Then you realize, oh crap, I've got 10 extra pounds or 20 extra pounds around my belly. Need to like fix that now. And so that's the other thing is having, having a way to fix yourself and get back on track. It's a lot easier to do it if you do it, if you're already in that mode doing it and then the fixes are small. It's funny you said that because that's when you were talking, that's exactly what came to my mind where human beings inherently, it seems like we only address problems when they actually are too big to ignore. But it's so much easier to simply take preventative measures than it is to deal with a problem once it becomes something that is impacting and negatively affecting your life. Yeah. And if it goes too far, it can actually get beyond a point where it is fixable, or at least to be able to get back to where you were. And then you're, you know, you sometimes lose things that are never recoverable. So yeah, that's why I got the aura ring so that I can get on that level set. And fortunately my sleeping's pretty good. My rest, my resting heart rate is in the fifties, like 53. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty good for a guy my age. I'm, I'm 62 years old. And I have my, my blood pressure is super low. It's the 110 over 60. I think that's also pretty remarkable for someone my age, but I still have the belly thing. And <laughs> that, that tracks your HRV, right? As well, your heart rate. I don't even, oh, see, I didn't even know what that meant. So what does that mean to me? Okay. So basically the heart rate variability, like you don't want your heart beat to be almost like a metronome. You want it to be like more flexible. So for example, if you're like walking up the stairs, you're doing different things. If there's a little bit of time between the heart rate, where sometimes it's beating at this rate versus others, then that means that your heart is actually more healthy because it's more flexible. So yeah. HRV is actually like one of the more important metrics to measure. Another thing which is actually, which you might want to look into is you can, and actually Lucas, when I did a chat with him and he recommended like icing your private areas to increase your testosterone levels. I think I remember reading in, in a book, The 4-Hour Body from Tim Ferriss, where if you wanted to, you could either take a cold shower or you can put like some cold packs on your belly and that will actually like shrink the fat because what it does is, from my understanding, again, I'm not like, I'm not like a doctor or anything like that, but cold exposure will actually convert some of the white fat tissue into brown adipose tissue, which is higher in mitochondria. And not only will it shrink the fat, but it'll, it'll actually, it's actually, it'll convert the fat from one type of fat, white fat to the brown fat. And my, from my experience, I think that just putting some, some putting some cold packs there or taking a cold shower will actually help reduce that area as well. It's kind of like the Wim Hof method. Yeah, exactly. So I just found on my thing, it says there's an HR, V and I'm a 40. See, this is my resting heart rate, 53. 
And then the 40, I don't know what the 40 means. It says max 109 mil, 40 milliseconds and then a max 109 milliseconds, whatever that means. I have no idea. I'll have to look it up. But when I'm on my walk, I make sure that I walk briskly. And so I try to get my heart rate up and maintain it anywhere from 120 to 130 beats a minute. And then I come home and obviously let it settle down. So I don't know if that's what we mean by variable rate or if this is something, if that's the kind of flexibility that I'm looking for. But I'm never winded. I have incredible endurance. I can go all day without any problem whatsoever. You're at the age where taking care of your health is an enormous priority because my dad is not, he's not a very healthy person. And because of that, he actually had to retire at about 65. Yet you have other people like some of his friends who are still working at 75, like 76. So what we do now to take the necessary precautions, and I do understand that some of it is luck. You can do everything possible to put the odds in your favor, but you can just simply become unlucky and then something bad could happen to you. But in, if you take 100 people who do the right thing, then you're probably going to extend your life and your quality of life and your ability to work and be productive by a good like five or 10 years. And in my opinion, I definitely think that's worthwhile. Yeah. The measurement, like I said, I think is key. Doing the measurement, being consistent with it. And the consistency is a little bit different. You should be doing that level set thing every day, but then also every once in a while, introduce some stress to yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, they call it like hormesis, where a little bit of stress actually makes you stronger. It's like stronger by stress. Anti-fragility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I talk about that quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I talk about how you can even put that or incorporate that into your trading strategy. In fact, I, this is going to be the weirdest transition ever, but also appropriate that we both concentrate on collecting premium, which is, in fact, I think a an anti-fragility -fragil type of practice, because the thing that makes us stronger is actually going head head first into volatility and volatility is what is the source of a more premium so i just thought i'd throw that in there but it's an interesting yeah true it's kind of being a contrarian it's when the vix is trading at 30 or 35 and many people are super scared i actually think that the time to be scared is when the vix is trading anywhere from like 12 to 15 or 16 mm -hmm. because during that time when everyone's euphoric then you're selling options on elevated at on elevated prices and then even like a 10 or 15 percent pullback with an associated increase in VIX can wreak significant amounts of havoc whereas even last year in 2022 when the market sold off tremendously and some market leaders were off like 50 and tesla was down almost 70 percent i think for the most part the VIX stayed between like 25 and 30 and then towards the end of the year it, it delved down into like the low 20s, but it never spiked up above 40. I think at one point, maybe in January, February, it hit a high in, in the mid or high 30s. Maybe I'm wrong, but like I, I know I'm pretty sure it didn't spike up over 40. But during those times when the VIX is like over 30, that's actually when you can be a little bit more aggressive because once prices have come down a little bit as well and volatility is higher, you get that double positive whammy of being able to collect more premium and you're selling options on a lower basis for the stocks or the indices that you're selling that you're selling premium on. So one, one thing that I found over the years, now I've been in the industry for a long time, and I've been a hedge fund manager, an institutional trader. And all, my the first part of my career was as an IT specialist. I was a former chief architect for Sun Microsystems. And uh, I actually worked on Wall Street and they were my main customers. But uh, the one thing I wanted to say about volatility that I found was that it's all relative. You can look at VIX at 40 or 30 or 20 or 15 or whatever, but there's always some level of noise that is behind or under underneath where, wherever that VIX level is. And it's when the VIX rises above that noise level that you start seeing a signal that you can actually see or operate with. So you can actually have lower levels of volatility, but as long as it, you can detect the signal that comes above that, it's just that it's when it's lower, it's much more difficult to see that because the noise is like a, a constant low level of noise activity that happens in the market. And when it gets too low, it's almost impossible to distinguish a noise from noise from a signal. But I think it's the relative change that is that is most important. And that's what you're trying to detect. Would you agree with that? 
I do. I also think, and hopefully I'm able to communicate this well, I think that the absolute VIX level at, let's say, 18 or 17 or 16 is important, but it's also important to know like where it came from. So in 2022, where the market fell like 20% and many leading stocks fell significantly more, having the VIX come down from like 30 to 18 to me, bodes well for where the market is going to be in 2023. Whereas if the market had basically, if 2022 had been an amazing year where the market was up like 20, 30% or 20%, whatever, and volatility had been relatively consistent, staying at around 15 to 18 for a long period of time, at that time, I would actually be more concerned that we're going to experience a greater pullback in the near future. But now, considering that volatility was recently, a few months ago, was trading in the mid 20s, like even high 20s, and now it's trading close to around 20. And even I think last week, it traded around like 17 before, before spiking up a little bit. I think that indicates that, at least like right now, based upon the available information that we have, that 2023 is probably going to be a relatively stable year. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I Maybe. But I, I wanted to touch a little bit on, on our, our different trading strategies. Yours is definitely longer term than mine. You're selling puts and you're probably looking out, what, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, something like that for most of your positions. So yeah. the volatility sometimes, in that... I'm sorry, go ahead. Sometimes if I'm trading indices... And there aren't that many opportunities in the individual stocks on my watch list. I'll sometimes go out like even three to five days on like the Qs or SPX or SPY and then make a relatively quick trade. Because in that situation, especially now, I actually, for example, if Qs are, I'll sell like the 275 or 280s on the Qs with a short duration. Because even if, let's say, next week is horrible, I could easily roll that position down like five or 10%. And then it'll get to a point where I actually don't even mind taking ownership of that specific stock and then participate in the upside. Or what I could do to protect the downside risk, I would do something where I'll buy an at the money put and then sell an in the money put if I believe that something is oversold and therefore I actually don't have any downside risk and then it allowed me to participate in the upside by selling that in the money put while also collecting a small amount of extrinsic premium by the in the money put. So what I was trying to figure out and that you so you've explained it, how do you guard against those that variability of vol volatility in that life cycle of the option? So the way I do it is I trade super short, zero DTE, just one single day. So the only really the only real variability in volatility is really the daily volatility that you see. Occasionally, you'll have a binary event that will happen during the day, like the Fed is doing a meeting at two o'clock or something, and, vol and implied volatility will rise right into that occasion, but then it will fall off. But normally during a single day, you have more volatility in the morning, so it's implied volatility is up. You can get into a trade because you, be you have better pricing, and then it starts falling away and then it might come up a little bit in the just before the close and the other thing that aids my trade is that time being on that very last day of expiration the one constant that you have is time no matter what everything's going to zero at yep. four o'clock so it doesn't matter if volatility goes way up or way down within that day by the end of the day it's going one place it's not going right. to there's nothing you can do so that's what I was wondering. When you expand that out to several days or a month or something like that, that's got to be, I'm just wondering, if you're in a position, how do you handle that that change in volatility and changing your position? Does it throw you off the position? Do you try to do something to take, I don't know, to guard against it or take advantage of it or put it in your, how do you put it in your favor? So basically when we sell out of the money, there's a few things that you can do. One, you can go further out of the money to decrease the risk and to increase your probability of profit. Additionally, you have to make sure that the options that you sell, the options that you sell and the underlyings that you choose, whether they're specific stocks or indices, that they're not like high flying stocks where you're basically gambling. You want something that's like a market leading stock that has relatively that you're not going to have to 
It's not going to come out with an FDA approval or some type of government requirement that is going to make your stock lose 50% of its value in a few days. But assuming that, that let's say you have that control for, even if you win 95% of your trades, that does not guarantee that you're going to be a profitable trader because the name of the game in everything that we do when we sell options, yes, we're playing, yes, we're making very high probabilistic trades. But the reason why the probability profit is so high is because upfront when you're collecting premium, how much your maximum profit is going to be. And your risk is going to be, in some cases, it's going to be undefined or it's going to be significantly higher than the amount of profit that you're making. And because of that asymmetric risk profile, what you really have to do is you have to make sure that you either have a stop loss strategy where if your option suddenly balloons up for about two to three times more than you sold it for it, then you have a hard stop and you get out. Or what I like to do is you have to buy options. You, you really do. And this is something that I think maybe three or four years ago, I was, was I wouldn't necessarily say I was like super against it, but now after I experienced a loss with PayPal in 2022, because hey, PayPal ticked like all the boxes. At one point, it was valued at about $300 billion or something. It was very stable. It had consistent income. But when PayPal fell from $310 all the way down to about $220, I thought that it was relatively safe. And I was wrong. And I lost money on that trade. And it allowed me to think and say, okay, look, you really need to buy options because in certain respects and in certain cases, the stock or the index is not going to rebound. And if you're wrong, you have to make sure that you're able to quickly recover the losses from a trade that goes against you. And probably the, the most important thing is to trade small, right? And then additionally, let's say you sell and going back to what I was saying about the queues, if you actually genuinely want to take ownership of the stock, because on a long-term basis, especially indices, they have a tendency to go up, then it's okay to sell naked if you're going to sell queues at 270 and then the market has a really bad month, you roll it down to 255, 260, and then you just simply take ownership and then participate again, participate in the upside. If you want to sell some calls against that, then you can do that. But I genuinely think that keeping your size small and also either trading spreads or buying options, if you don't want to actually own the underlying that you're trading, is vitally important because amateurs can really sell options on indices or market leading stocks and they can have a high win rate. But the name of the game is you have to make sure that you buy options or you have a risk profile or you have a risk, you have a plan in there to make sure that you reduce your portfolio volatility. So it seems like there's there's a caveat with every move that you make. So you're, you have to counteract it. Is there a point where you decide that you can no longer roll or you can no longer define your risk? It just keeps on going down and you just cut it loose? It depends on the specific trade. If there are some trades that I'll sell options on where if it hits a certain point, then I'll just simply close it out for a loss. There are other trades that I'll trade as a spread. And then there are a significant amount of trades that I'll make if I trade them naked where I actually don't really care if the trade goes against me because I feel that I could potentially make more money by being long that stock than I would be from collecting a small amount of premium. So it depends. Like if I'm selling something like like on DG, like Dollar General, because it's relatively, relatively recession proof, but I probably don't necessarily want to own that because a dollar store, do I really want to be long that for 10 or 15 years, like long term? Probably not. But then if I'm selling something like Hughes or like Amazon, if I sell it at 75 put and it gets put to me when it was trading at 185, like last year, I think that the odds are and the asymmetric risk profile from that perspective of owning Amazon at 75 is actually pretty damn good. So it really depends upon the situation. But I think that the most important thing, probably more so than simply trying to make as much money as possible, because we all want to make as much money as possible, but our goal should be to limit portfolio volatility and make sure that 
our drawdowns are as small as possible. And then as a natural consequence of that, you'll just make money naturally by selling and picking up and collecting premium as long as you just focus on reducing your portfolio volatility and minimizing your risk. Yeah, it's interesting. So I'm going to tell you how I go about doing all of those things. But it, it sounds like on, on your strategy, it would benefit to have a slightly larger portfolio, especially if you can get into port, portfolio margin and that yeah. sort of thing. So that's where your strategy is leading to. It, it's definitely not for somebody who's trading, say, $5,000. It would be very difficult to manage something like that. Is that true? You can if you're trading spreads. But like I tell people, for example, with my trade alerts, they're they cost like $349. So when I tell people, so when people email me and they say, hey, I have $2,000, should I join your alerts? I immediately tell them because I don't, I want, it's very important to manage people's expectations. I say, hey, you're not going to make enough money on your two to $5,000 account to pay the monthly fee. If you want to join for a month because you're curious and you want to view it as like an investment in your education, hey, no problem. But don't come and think they are going to turn 5,000 into 10,000 in two to three months. Because if you do that, the more risk you take, the more inherent, or rather, the more money you want to make, the more inherent risk that you're taking as well. So yeah, in general, like it, it's similar to what you said, where it is generally geared towards people who have larger accounts. Okay. I also work on extreme asymmetry, but in exactly the opposite way. So in other words, I, uh, I define my risk. So it's extremely small and the potential profit isn't unlimited. It's also limited, but it's relatively large. And so the way we do that is by using a particular strategy. And that is the butterfly, the out of the money butterfly. So we push the, the, uh, the butterfly out of the money so that our risk is approximately one to nine. So it's a one part risk to nine parts reward. And it's an easy trade to put on. You've probably seen this in professional circles. They used to call it the 10% uh, the debit rule. And essentially you make your debit one tenth of the, the spread on the butterfly. And by doing that, you're, you're creating a kind of return distribution that is right skewed and uh, long tails. And for those who don't know what I'm saying, it means that you take a lot of very small losses and a fair amount of small wins that tend to offset those losses. But then you're looking for those occasional midsize and big wins. And that's a profile that's real nice. Now, the really cool part about the strategy is that it does exactly what you're saying, is that the drawdowns are super small if you can when you manage that. Drawdowns are small and the volatility on your, your profit curve are, is also very low. But the key, again, paralleling what you're doing, it's just interesting how we look at from two completely different angles and come to the same kind of profile structure that we're looking for. But the key is to also trade small. So as an example, and this is in no way representative of what everybody can do, right? But I think that if, if someone followed the strategy that they could achieve this, I never trade more than max, depends on my account size. Let's say my larger six-figure account, I never trade more than say three quarters of a percent in any one position, usually half a percent or even quarter of a percent for a position. And so a lot of people might think, yeah, what do you do with all the rest of the money? But it's the same thing even in a smaller account, like a 25,000 or even a 10 or even a $5,000 account. You might trade just 1% of your position. But by keeping your position size super small, you're limiting your downside. You're keeping your, uh, your drawdowns to sub 10%. Actually, I've never gone more than 5%. In fact, my past year, I've never gone above three and a quarter percent drawdown. And while maintaining a good return on your risk. So on average, I think I'm doing my average winners are two, a little more than two times the size of the with super low volatility. In our, so it's a very comfortable way to trade. Now, your comfort comes from never being so far out of the money and your high win rate and then being very diligent about managing your profit. And so managing your risk in a could be a relatively sophisticated way, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say there are a few things like the simplest way is if the option that you currently sold that you have a position on reaches like three times the credit that you received, then you can just simply close it out. And then the other thing which I really like to do is, especially during times when the VIX is low, I'll buy long dated 
put options that go very far out on SPX. And that will basically provide the necessary insurance on my entire portfolio. So remember, when the VIX is low, that means that people's expectation of future volatility is that is also low and that they believe that the market's going to be stable. And because of that, the options that you buy are really inexpensive because the VIX tends to come to, to go up and down in waves. If you're buying long dated SPX or SPY put options when volatility is low, then you can actually make anywhere from 30 to 50 times on your money if you end up having a huge crash like in March 2020 or even like a slow drawdown market in 2022. So yeah, you definitely, like everything that we say, if you're going to sell premium, the name of the game is managing the outlier risk and managing those few trades that go against you. And if you're able to do that, you will make money, but it's not as easy as people think, because especially when you have a very high win, human nature and tendency is to get greedy. Oh, let's trade a little bit bigger. Oh, I went too far out of the money. If I only traded, if I traded a little bit closer to be in the money, I would collect more, I would collect more premium and then I would make more money. So you have to make sure that you manage that greed aspect. So how much would you say that you would normally at any one time have deployed into these positions as a percent of your total portfolio? For the short put positions. So if I open up like a new position, how much am I, how much of my entire, how well, much that, of my portfolio am I deploying? Do you only do one position at a time or do you have multiple multiples on at any one time? I usually, I have multiple positions on and usually it'll be anywhere from I say on average about three, three to five percent or so. Oh, now so it, it's it's really it, small. It's a little bit tricky though because when using portfolio margin and when you go farther out of the money, portfolio margin it doesn't count the buying power requirements similar to to regulation T. So if that position ended up getting challenged, then that three percent might balloon up to I would say probably a max of ten percent. But also remember that. When you have when you have that position covered, when you have the long puts on to provide you with insurance, then actually it's not going to increase your risks because as the market comes down, then your total equity is either staying the same or it's actually increasing based upon the hedge that you have in place. So I guess the ultimate question then is, what is the level of or a percent of your total portfolio that you would allow to come to risk? Oh, that's a good question. With the hedges in place, I would say it's pretty low, probably about 3%. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's on par with what I'm doing, but it, I'm a little bit less than that, under 1%, because we never really take more than one position at a time, it, because it's it's hard to manage anything more than that in a single day. But So what do you do with the rest of the money? I leave it in there. I mean, it, in the cash sweep, it gets about like 4%, and then I deploy it. Yeah. I, remember, I have numerous positions on. So for example, I will have generally about five or six positions on and I'll be using about 40% of my total account size when I'm fully invested. Now, when the VIX is really low and when I believe that prices are high, because let's say we go up on like a euphoric run like we did in January and mid-February of 2020, then in that situation, I actually trade significantly less. And that's actually the time that would be like the perfect time to buy options because everyone is so euphoric that your long dated put options that you can use as a hedge mm -hmm. are going to be incredibly inexpensive. And then obviously it's not always going to work out as well as March 2020, where those options are going to spike up. But I think in general, trading anywhere for and using a maximum of like probably 60% of your account, even if you're trading on using vertical credit spreads, then I think that that's like a safe way to trade because when you're trading spreads, you are managing that outlier risk. So you can be a little bit more aggressive. And usually I don't necessarily trade like traditional spreads where I'm not, it's pretty rare for me to put on a trade as a spread. Instead, what I usually do, well, I'll have portfolio insurance by buying those long dated put options, and then I will sell naked positions against it on a shorter dated basis. Yeah, I'm a bit more conservative than that. I'm trading, never really putting much more than a percent at risk. 
And then the rest of the money, I'm actually rotating in and out of short-term government securities. Just Are you trading every day? Yeah. And are you trading individual stocks or primarily indices? No, the only thing that we I trade and the people in my group is the is options on derivatives of the S and P. Trading options on the SPX or the E mini futures or even the uh, micro SPX, which is the XSP. But that's it. So SPX is worthwhile, especially if you use portfolio margin, because then it's twelve fifty six, like cash yep. settles. So therefore, it's sixty forty. So you get that tax advantage benefit. Right. And uh, yeah, so that the futures too. and the, yeah, exactly, and the ES as well. So yeah, that's beneficial. And then, so your trade, even if there's like an FOMC announcement, like it doesn't really, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Actually, that's usually better. It's yeah, interesting. It's, it's interesting because I'm going to ask you some questions about how you actually size your your trade or how you decide where to put it and that sort of thing. So we don't really use any kind of technical analysis or worry about sizing. The uh, The market volatility does all of that for us and actually tells us where to put the trade simply by putting on a one to nine risk to reward. So a lot of people will ask, what's the delta that you uh, trade to? Or how many strikes out do you go? And I say, I have no idea. I just make it one to nine. That's it. And then it just puts it where I want. Now, I have two different strategies that I use that it's interesting because uh, back in 2021, we had a very different market from what we have today. And this is something else I want to ask you about because these different market types. 2021, we had an extremely accom accommodative monetary policy. The market was just going up, volatility super low, going in one direction. And so when I first started up this service, I wanted to do this asymmetric trade, but I felt, okay, just put one butterfly and make it directional. And I had this idea that I would create a market bias or a directional bias and do all of this fancy geo macro economic analysis. And uh, so I thought it was brilliant. I choose mostly going long and I would hit there and I would have this incredible win rate of anywhere from 75 to 95%. And it was unbelievable. I would hit all these trades. I would pin trades on a regular basis. And I, once 2022 came around and the market went the other way, everything changed and I started to get brazen. And instead of taking the kind of risk that I was taking, I decided to take more risk and it bit me. And so now we do the exact same trade as the, what I call the classic butterfly, but we put it on both sides of the market now. So we open up every day, same thing, one to nine, but one above the market, one below the market, and then just manage those. My original trade, we never, I never even managed the the risk. I just let it, if it went the other way, I just let it go to 100% loss. So in terms of- You're delta neutral when you're putting on the trades? I, you could say, or, um, yeah, when I put on the trade, you're delta neutral because you're trying to put them on at approximately the same time and with the same risk to reward. And you're, you're, what you're hoping for is at least some movement either towards one fly or the other. And if it doesn't, about 35% of the time, it hangs out right in the middle of those two. And instead of going 100% risk on those duels, we just go to a 50% risk. And that's like a hard stop. It goes over 50%, you just get out. The rest of the time, then you manage your profits when it, when it reaches one of the flies or the others. And we break up the day into three different segments, the morning session, the F uh, or the opening, the morning opening session, the afternoon session and the closing session, because there's a distinct difference in the way premium decays in those three periods. Is it like 9.30 to 11, 11 to 2, and then 2 to 4? Close. A 9.30 to noon to 2.30, then 2.30 to 4. Yeah, funny. We saw some very similar cycles <laughs> in the market. Yeah, yeah. So we create this framework around that time. And then we also look at the proximity of price to the to your profit curve or more. Actually, we use the, the butterfly as a, a way to measure where we are relative to the profit curve. And either you're outside of the break even of the PL, or you're between the PL break even and the butterfly break even, or you're inside the butterfly. And so then we look at those three. So the time and the distance are like the two dimensions that we cross. And from there we can evaluate where we are, what we expect, the, how the market should behave, because it basically behaves essentially the same way within that time, time frame with some variance. But premium is decaying at approximately the same rate, just that some days it might be big and some days it might be small in terms of, of its decay. But it's always pretty much the same. We put on the same with trade. So the amount of premium is always the same. And we're hoping that we can bring the trade as close to the to expiration as possible.
So it's it's fairly deterministic. It's the hard part for most people that are trading this strategy is deciding when to push the button to get out of the trade. There's such a there's such a, a draw to want to hang on as long as you can, hoping that you're going to get deep into the butterfly and get a pin trade. But that it, statistically, that's not going to happen very often. So that's the hard part is to get people to meet where they are, do some sort of mental trailing stop, and then get out when is the best time. So that's generally how we manage things. Are you familiar with David Sun? He's uh, He has a hedge fund, and I think he also runs like a zero DTE strategy. I think I, I did an interview with him. I think around like January 27th of like 2022, about a little over a year ago. He has a pretty good podcast. No, I'm not familiar with him. I'll have to check him out. Yeah, he's he does like zero DTE as well. Zero DTE is becoming huge amongst institutional traders too. It's the uh, the number of zero DTE options that are being hired has absolutely exploded o- over the last year and even over the last six months. And it helps as well that SPY like and a lot of the exchange, the indices are going more towards like daily expirations, which helps tremendously as well. Five days a week, we have expirations. Crazy. Yep. So yeah, we started, when I first started the service, there was only three expirations per week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Then they added the five. Then they added five to the E-mini. And then now they've also added five to the XSP, which is the micro version of the SPX. Which is interesting because now you can do interesting things with the full size index and this micro index. So you can do things like gamma hedging, for instance. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into the like the E mini. What was the symbol for the SPX, like the mini contract? The XSP. XSP. All right, cool. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah, the biggest difference between them is that GAX and the XSP, you generally trade during the mar- during market hours. There are a few brokers that allow you to trade outside market hours because it does trade around the clock, but there's very few brokers available to retail traders. I think TradeStation and Interactive Broker allow you to trade it, but Interactive Bro- Brokers platform, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is I hate that platform. Yeah. But yeah, most it's, kind of, it's not like a very pretty UI UX. It's yeah, it's a little antiquated. It's antiquated, and every time they add features to it, they don't deprecate any of the old features. So they just keep on adding on to it until oh, it's this big kludge and there's 30 ways to do everything. And then they have horrible customer support. So that makes it even worse. But most other trading platforms like Thinkorswim or Tastyworks or E-Trade or any of the others will allow you to only trade SPX and XSP during market hours. And so then the big drawer of uh, e- the E-mini is that it trades 23 hours a day. So you can do some interesting things prior to the market opening. So for instance, if you have a very, if you have a, a big economic report coming at 8.30, like the CPI is coming out and it's causing all kinds of impl- volatility to spike prior to that. Sometimes it's worthwhile to put a, a trade on prior to the market report and then take it off before the market even opens after the market report's over. Yeah, especially because immediately you're going to get a decrease in VIX and volatility on that specific option or on that security. So therefore, it's almost like irrespect intimating back to what you were saying, where on the FOMC, volatility is high in the morning because everyone's concerned. And then at 2 p.m., you can almost immediately take that trade off because volatility is going to collapse. Yeah, we're here. You can take it off after 830 before the market opens and you've made really good return because of that volatility crush. I believe it's called. Yeah, that's generally how we play it. And but I find that the biggest, hardest part for people is developing that that discipline. So getting into the trade, getting into any trade, I think for most people, I think for most, let me rephrase that. For most retail traders, they think it's all about getting the right setup. Right? Getting into a trade and just give me the right setup and I can make money. What they don't realize is that's probably the least important thing. Getting into the trade is easy. It's pushing the button and taking profit that is the most difficult. Yeah, because your inherent desire of thinking, oh, I'm leaving money on the table if I close this out now. But in reality, you're actually, no one ever went broke by taking profits. But if you try to get too greedy, then that trade can turn around and losses hurt about three to four times more than the gains feel good. So if you have a profit and your gut feeling is that you should take off that trade, then guess what? you should probably take off that trade. So how do you go about teaching your students 
that process, that discipline of when to take profits? Are they following you or are you trying to make them, give them the experience they need to be independent? How does that work? Yeah, that's an amazing question. Basically, so it depends. Like some people, I would say maybe 30 or 40% of people, they don't necessarily have a desire to do things independently because let's say they have a very large account then they can simply subscribe to the alerts every single month and then make trades themselves. And it really takes away the thought process. So I do understand that a lot of people who might be watching this, they might say, oh, that they might think that the whole thing about teach a man to fish and then you can, you can feed them for a lifetime versus give a man a fish, you feed them for a day. But some people are just very busy. They have large accounts and they enjoy receiving those alerts and then just simply following them and making the trades. In the course, I always recommend that people close out their naked options anywhere from 50 to 70%. And also, as a caveat to that, if you make a trade and you're let's, you realize, let's say, 30 to 50% of the profit in 10 to 20% of the time, then it's actually in your best interest to close out that trade early and redeploy the capital because why are you going to then wait an incremental 70 to 80% of the time only to collect an, an additional 50% of the premium? So one of the easiest ways of making sure that you close out your trades early is that immediately upon making and entering the new trade, you could just simply submit a buy to close order with a limit order for about anywhere from 50 to 65 to 70% of the credit. So if you were able to collect a dollar and then you can just simply put a buy to close order to automatically close out that position when that option decays and it's trading at about 40 cents. And in my opinion, that is, that's the easiest way of doing it because it's basically automatic. So for every trade that you open, you submit a buy to close order. And when you have a smaller account, that's even more important to manage your capital to be for capital efficiency purposes and to manage your buying power. Because if you have anywhere from a two to ten thousand dollar account, you need to be very ruthless of closing out your trades early, especially when they go in your direction in a relatively fast and, and relatively expeditious manner, and then simply redeploying that capital. So what other decisions do you make to to optimize that decision where you actually place that stop 50 to 75%, 75%, that's another 50% on top of the profit you may have taken at just 50%. Are you using any other indicators that might sway you more towards a 75% or a 50%? Is there any kind of technical indicator that you might use that, that might incline you to make your, your stop looser or tighter? Yeah, I think if I'm pretty confident in the trade, then I will try to go more towards, let's say, for example, to leave it like a little bit less like black and white and based upon like feeling and something. Let's say VIX is trading over like 20 or even over 25. Then inherently, you're going to feel better about the trades that you're making because they're actually less risky. Because in order for the VIX to increase to that level, then that means that the market had to have pulled back a little bit and therefore... It was previously trading at a higher level. And also you're collecting relatively substantially more premium. So in that case, when volatility is higher, then you can also potentially be a little bit more aggressive. And especially if you believe that a specific stock, like let's say a Microsoft or like an index, like a QQQ is oversold and you feel more confident in your entry, then in that situation, you can open up a trade and then you can immediately place a buy to close order to close it out at about 35 or 40 percent of the premium that you actually receive if vix is trading at about anywhere from like 15 to 18 and the market is relatively high then that means that your risk is higher for there being a pullback because there's more complacency in the market and the market always moves in waves so in that situation i would have a tendency to be more careful and to close out my trades more aggressively at a 50 percent price point is there a, a situation where you would let it go to expiration? There are. Generally, if I'm trading, let's say, for example, especially because I'm using portfolio margin, if I trade something that has a relatively short like expiration, like three to five days and on the X or Qs, and it's so far out of the money and it's not really using up any buying power, 
and also I don't need the buying power, then in that case, I would I would just let it expire. But I would say, but in general, I do think that it's good practice to close out all your trades early. And that's probably something that, that I should improve upon. Do I always close out like every trade early? I don't, but should I do it? I probably should, to be honest. Oh, okay. Yeah. So th that's the, uh, that's the biggest variability between someone who makes a little and someone who really does well. And my strategy is being able to choose when's the right time to get out because we, there's no way for us to say, Hey, just set a stop at 50% because that wouldn't make any sense when some trades you'll make maybe 20 to a hundred percent return on your risk because we take such small risk. But then there are other trades. If you are, if you let it go to expiration, you could literally make a thousand to fifteen hundred percent on your trade. So you have to. So how do you advise? There are a number of ways. One is expectation, and that's what it, when I mentioned earlier that we're very cognizant of what our overall return distribution should look like. That we know that there's going to be a certain number of trades that are going to be small, and I mean by anywhere from a twenty maybe to 150% return on our risk. And then there's, and that's going to comprise about, I'd say 40 to 50% of our trade, maybe more, maybe 60% of our winners. Then there's going to be another sub segment that's going to be between 150 and 250 and that, or maybe even 300% return on our risk. And that's going to be maybe another 20%. Or more, actually, I would say that the initial one would probably be closer to maybe seventy-five percent, and then about and then about fifteen percent are those mid-size, and then about ten percent are the really big ones that are close to a pin trade. So having that realization of what to expect, that the vast majority of your trades, sixty-five, seventy percent of them, are going to be small. You tend to have a a quick trigger when you see that price isn't making an advance into the later parts of the day towards your fly. And uh, having that discipline to take those trades then is really important because there's only a very small portion of times when it's going to really go out there. Most of the time, price tends to go out there. You have a sharp move in the early morning, then it tends to grind up towards the end of the day. Those are the type of trades that you can hold on to. But then the rest of those trades, the market is fluctuating, going all over the place. You need to take those smaller profits and be diligent about them because if you don't, then they go to 100% loss. Now you're, you're that's a huge swing that where you could have taken, say, a 50 or 100% return. Right. And then now you're 100% or a 200% loss, which is nuts. So it really comes down to the expectation. That's one part and un understanding what, what to, what percentage are going to get in there and whatever. And then there are some, I guess you could say this, some price action things that you could look at. But primarily what we look at is volume profile. And the volume profile, I don't know if you've looked at volume profile at all before. I've looked at it, but I'm not an expert at it and I don't look at it consistently. So I've been now volume profile from a from an institutional trader's point of view, volume is everything. Liquidity is everything. Can I take my block of trades and can I push them into that level or not? That's pretty much what how a institutional trader thinks. And now Volume profile can show you where those areas of liquidity or illiquidity are. But more importantly, the profile is a great way of seeing something that's called market memory. Now, if, I don't know if you've heard of this concept, but it was a concept that I think that was originally brought up by Benoit Mandelbrot, the guy who brought us like fractal geometry and Mandelbrot sets, that sort of thing. And a lot of his theories are actually used in modern day hedge funds. But anyways, he had this I idea of market memory, and that is, it's not just market memory, but the idea extends to all systems, whether they're natural or human-made, that when impactful events happen in the past, they tend to leave some sort of indelible impression upon the system. Yeah. And that, th that impression carries through right to the present day, and it will influence price. The volume profile, what it shows is like the striations of that those impressions. And so you can mark up the volume profile and create what I call a market structure and then see the, the memory of the market and then use that in the present day as definitive support and resistance zones, as well as liquidity and illiquid 
illiquidity zones, and then to make some value judgments on how you think price is likely to move and then make decisions based on that. I think what you said is so important because not only are we as like children in Delaware, like we're so impressionable as children and that actually impacts how we behave as adults. But also remember that during March of 2020, the world had never seen a situation like that happen before. And I think VIX spiked all the way up to 84. And then if you'll remember, even now, like when the market is relatively, I wouldn't say it's like relatively stable now, but I think that March 2020 left an impression on the market where volatility at 15, if it, fall, if it falls back to 15, is relatively comparable to having the VIX and volatility trade at 12 previously. Because I don't think the market factored in this type of pandemic situation previously. But because we now experience that, I think that a case can be made that based upon the market memory and the market profile, that we're going to, at least for the short term future, be constantly in elevated VIX levels where a VIX at 15 is the old VIX at 12. What's really interesting, it's even more impactful than you think. I agree 100% that those type of levels, they they stay with us for a long time. But even the most minute variances that happen over a long period of time in the profile, you'll see, for instance, the profile basically looks like a bunch of nodes of concentrated volume and then absence of nodes where there's little volume. Now, a lot of people in volume profile study it from a session point of view. They think that they have to look at each session and then look at the shape of the session and be able to tell where support and resistance are. But that's not where support and resistance lie. And that's not where liquid and illiquid zones lie. They lie in the, the very long term. So we look at two, three years of data and the profile from that area. And then the, the transition from small or low volume to high volume is one area that is very impactful. The other area of impact are the low levels of volume that that just seem to disappear into nothing. For this, there'll be, for instance, like 50, 53, 32, that level. I'm, not, I'm just making up something which doesn't even exist yet. We'll have like really low volume. And for whatever reason, when price goes up there, it finds either resistance or support at that volume. Why? I have no idea. Why does nobody decide to trade that level for years, right? Mm-hmm. But that's what happens. And so you can find these areas on the profile and then basically just draw lines. And then that more or less illustrates where these indents, I guess you could call it in the market. And you would think that over time that uh, that they would disappear, but it takes a really long time, years, maybe even decades for, for pricing in levels to, to lose their impact. So they are actually more impactful than some of the more traditional things that people look at, like high and low levels or market opens or closes or from just or trend lines that they draw that are just looking at pricing that only goes back maybe 30 or 40 days. Think of it this way. When you if you get a scar or if you get a cut, right, and it produces a scar in seven years. Your skin and all the cells around that place where you got the cut will completely change. And so in seven years' time, not a single cell will be the same where that cut was, yet the scar remains. That's like what the market is. You have yeah. this change that goes over and over, but those scars, they remain in the market to this day, to the present day. And it's one of the few things that I think, and man, I'll show it to you sometime. It's uh, just incredible. I draw these lines from data that happened or price action that happened two or three years ago. And then you look at those same lines in a five-minute chart. And price is bouncing off of them, like like they were made yesterday. So there is this thing called that is known as market memory. There's been academic papers written on it, and it's really incredible. And what amazes me is that so few people actually use it or know about it. But it's been written about decades ago by some of the most famous mathematicians ever. And and everyone ignores it. They all make up. It's almost. I feel today's technical analysis and some other methods that are being used in the market, like Fibonacci and Elliott Wave and whatever else that you want to put out there. It's like people are looking for a way to describe something that's uh, that they can't describe. So they come up with these very elaborate explanations on how and why they should work, but they yeah, don't. Yeah. That's <laughs> like human behavior. They always want to affix an explanation to something and they try to see patterns that might not necessarily yeah, do the whole 
just fill the hole with something that that you can convince people that that's the reason you can fill the hole. And I, I just find it I just find it interesting that we're always searching for things that aren't there. We're willing to believe things, but then when things are right in front of your face, it's like you can completely ignore them. Anyways, I don't know where that conversation's going. But I, oh, I know what it was. I was trying to explain what how we the market memory. Yeah, the market memory and how we decide to whether or not to stay in a position or in, or not. And that market memory of those areas that we draw up is one way that we look at whether or not we think that there's like a hard wall there, or there's going to be at least some level or probability that price will maintain that level. And if it doesn't, then we know that if it enters a an illiquid zone, it's likely to move fast. And this kind of explains the way markets react too. If you look at the volume profile, the areas where you have the big nodes those are areas of consolidation where the market has found value and it just tends to hang out there and move back and forth. That's why it creates the big node. And then the areas where there's hardly any volume, those are the areas where the market tends to trend because for whatever reason, the market's looking for value. Can't find it there, so it's looking for the next area of liquidity. And so you find that you'll have very long bars of movement in those illiquid zones or those what I call the volume wells, and then very short bars of movement in those big nodes. It more or less is telling you where price is going to have a tendency to move fast and where it's going to tend to not move so fast. And actually going back to something that you said a few minutes ago, I think it, it's really imperative to ascertain and really to take a measure of the overall price action. Because I know that like in 2022, there were numerous days where it seemed like the market wanted to rebound, but then almost like clockwork at around 2 p.m. Eastern, two hours prior to the market closing, the market would just fall off a cliff. Whereas when we're in a bull market, then it actually seems to be the opposite, where if the market is weak during the morning, then around two, it actually has a tendency to increase and then to be very strong heading into the close. So perhaps by integrating an overall general sense of market strength and then combining it with the market volatility profiles and looking at at things from the past, like you were saying about like market memory and volume and things like that. And that can provide you with a better clue as to what the future short-term price action is going to be and whether you should close out a trade or let it ride for a larger gain. Things like that still exist that are remnants of the old pit traders. The, uh, the bond traders used to close up shop at 3 p.m. The, the metals traders close shop at 2 p.m. And you can still see to this day price action that has that is impacted at those times in those markets, which is interesting. It's no longer exists, yet it still exists. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Where else do we bring this conversation, Dave? I don't know. I have about five more minutes or so, and then I have to help my wife with the kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to take the dogs for a walk pretty soon, too. So you want to wrap it up and then we'll do another call in a month or two? Oh, that would sound great. Yeah. I really enjoyed our conversation and learning more about your system and the way it works and the type of things that you're looking at. It's interesting from my perspective that we have very different ways of uh, approaching the market, yet so many things that we use are similar. Yeah. I'm really, the name of the game is as long as you can reduce and mitigate your portfolio volatility, then there's an extremely high chance that you will be a successful and profitable trader. Yeah. And so risk mitigation, it is everything. And I'm glad that we were able to get on the call. I just, I genuinely enjoy speaking with you and I value you tremendously. And I, I just, words really can't even express because I was struggling so much last year. Uh, I was in such a dark place. My wife receiving text messages on WhatsApp at two, three o'clock in the morning. It's just so much negativity. But I'm glad you're feeling better now too. That's great. Alrighty, so we'll wrap this up and then we'll do another call in a month or two. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. I don't know if you have a Super Bowl pick because we are doing this on Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday. You have a pick? I think I know one of the teams that's playing. I hate to admit that, but unless it's the Patriots that are playing, because I live right near Foxborough Stadium. And I don't even follow them anymore. I don't follow them anymore because Tom Brady's not playing. I'm kind of well, a kind of circling back to everything that we were talking about because I know that you're in like the higher latitudes. Do you take a D3 supplement or, or do you get your D, your vitamin D3 levels tested? Because that actually might be something as well. Because when you're in a higher latitude, especially during the winter time, maybe perhaps you've noticed that 
you gain more weight during the winter as opposed to during the summer when your body's able to produce more D3 naturally. I wouldn't be able to tell if I gain more or less weight because it just seems like I have a lot of weight. So it's hard to tell if I'm going up or down, but I do take a D3 supplement for sure. Okay. And, and I also make sure that I, I get enough salt in my body and other types of minerals. I take, I use that LMNT. Oh. Salt. You familiar yeah. with those? Yeah. LMNT, like Quinton, like they're very good, like electrolytes, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me feel good. Cool, man. All right, guys. Thank you so much. We'll post both of this on our channels and we're definitely going to do this again. I love just chatting with, with, with very experienced traders who are very helpful and who are incredible. Yeah. So we'll do this again for sure. Thanks, David. Feeling is mutual. Take care. All right. Take care.